Okay. Well, I'm very pleased to be here tonight and a uh, pleasure to see as many people who've come to be entertained. Uh, hopefully there'll be some, some information here too. Uh, you may notice that the title of the talk has changed from what was published in the HGS Bulletin, uh, Never Fear, uh, the, the, the subtitle of uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, commercial failure of shale gas will be mentioned. Uh, however, and I can, I can say this as a former HGS Bulletin editor, um, life moves pretty fast and, and 45 days ago was kind of an eternity. So. Uh, what I'm going to focus on tonight uh, is I'm going to look at, at two plays. I'm going to look at the Haynesville as a great example of a shale gas play, and I'm going to talk about the Eagleford shale, which is obviously more of, a, of an oil or a liquids play. And so, and, and the larger topic, uh, as you can read, is reflections on a decade of U.S. shale plays, and it is kind of just like it's humbling to have to say you have grandchildren. Uh, it's amazing that I've been following this stuff for, for 10 years, but there it is. So um, with that, we'll move along. And uh, as, as with all of uh, my themes and my topics, I'm not always right, um, but uh, I, I, I do stress being honest, at least about uh, my present take on things. And uh, when I say I'm not always right, it's partly because it's a moving target. Uh, we're all new at this shale game, even though We've been in it for 10 years. Uh, there's some tremendous uncertainties that remain regarding uh, reserve forecasting and the economics uh, of these plays. So I, I'm not uh, I'm not at all ashamed to to admit where what I know and what I think and what I'm interpreting. But there, there's a lot that I a lot that none of us know. I guess is is the bottom line. But. Uh, so, you know, here's the statement that uh, I guess really gets people excited. After 10 years of production, shale gas in the United States is a commercial failure. Uh, I'll get into what I mean by that. Uh, I mean what I say. Uh, it is a commercial failure. That doesn't mean that there are no shale wells or parts of shale plays that are commercially successful, but it means in general it's, it's a disaster. Um, that, that doesn't mean, I, I, I told you I'd be entertaining if I could. Um, <laughs> The U.S. has got a ton of gas, and a lot of it's shale gas, so that's, that, that's, not, that's not the topic, that's not the contention at all. But it is my belief, based on a lot of research, that to access that gas, particularly the shale gas, it's just gonna, it's gonna take a much higher price than anything close to what we've got right now. And I'll give you some, some data to support that. It's not just an opinion. The oil side of things, um, I hate to say it, but uh, these plays are marginally commercial at best. Uh, again, like like the gas plays, you know, it's not that none of them are are commercial, but most of them are marginal at best. Uh, but whatever we think about that, um, I think you can probably go to the bank with the fact that they are going to disappoint expectations for energy independence and long-term supply, and I'll show you why I think that. Shale plays are not a revolution, they're a retirement party, folks. And most of us in the Houston Geological Society are old enough to know what that means. Retirement parties are kind of awkward, uh, nobody really has very much fun, it's the best we can do, and now we can go live on a fixed income for the rest of our lives. But we don't have to work very hard, and that's the good part of it. Well, uh, shale has something to do with that. So, my first degree wasn't in science, so <laughs> it wasn't in theology either. The reason that most shale plays fail, or at least have great potential for failure, is what I'm going to call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first horseman is operating expense. The second is overhead cost. The third is interest expense. And the fourth is the failure or inability to identify the sweet spots before leasing and drilling. Now, I'll preface the rest of my talk by saying that None of the three first horsemen figure into shale play economics. Those are considered either sunk costs or fixed costs. So they're, they're, they're invisible. Uh, that's one of the reasons that these plays 
are a commercial failure because they don't count real costs. Uh, the final topic, uh, the inability to identify sweet spots before you spend a ton of money, is why we're not going to get very much better at them, in my opinion. Well, what is the break-even price of shale gas? Boy, this is, uh, you know, this, this, to call it a moving target, I mean, this, this is something that, that changes every time I pick up the paper. So Wood McKenzie has told us just a few weeks ago that nearly every U.S. gas play in the United States is economic at prices above $4. And my question back is, how much above $4? Is it 405? Is it 425? Or is it seven dollars? And so um, our friends at Woodmac, they you know they they show us a graph that says the long-term 425 forecast. I don't really know what that means, and they show a bunch of plays. So um, that's their call, and, and I, I you know I've I've co-presented with Wood McKenzie people. They're they're very knowledgeable and very. Uh, sanguine and, and, and sane, and this is just what they believe. Uh, so $7, well, the chart at the bottom is actually something Bank of America put together a few years ago, and as far as I know, it's, it's still quite valid. Uh, you can't read it, and I didn't intend for you to, but uh, this is basically every, every company that drills for gas in the United States, and what, what they conclude is that the median break-even price is seven dollars per MCFE. So Woodmax says it's four, Bank of America and a consortium says it's seven. Um, probably the answer is somewhere in between. But the question that you ask, or I ask, is what are your reserve assumptions? If you say that the break-even price is four dollars or four twenty-five or something like that, and let's talk about the Haynesville, because I'm going to show you some data on the Haynesville so I can, you know, you can hold me accountable for this. And you tell me that the average well in the Haynesville is going to make 6 to 8 BCF, and I tell you, well, that would be great if only it were true, but what would you say if the average well was going to make 4 BCF? Whoops. Well, where's your economics go if, if, your, if your reserves are half what you assumed they were? Well, everybody in this room knows where they go. They, they go down the tube. So first question you always have to ask is, what, you know, what are your reserve assumptions and where are you getting them from? Now, if you ask the companies that are in the plays, well, they're going to tell you they're going to tell you a really good story, but you've got to check it. Not that they're dishonest, but that's their business. Their business is to sell stock. Next question, which costs are excluded? I just told you about the three first horsemen. Okay, we're going to always exclude operating cost, overhead, and interest expense. And we didn't even talk about the cost of play entry, land costs. That, that's gone a long time ago. So if, if you exclude enough costs on any deal, whether it's oil and gas or whatever you're in, you can always show a profit if you don't show enough costs. Where do we hear most about this stuff? Well, we hear about it from sell-side brokerage and investment banks. And what are they selling? They're selling a point forward or partial cycle method for evaluating shale plays. Why? Ask them why. What's their business? Well, their business is selling stock and selling transaction fees. I mean, it's in their best interest. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting there's any dishonesty or unethical behavior here, but their business is to sell you stock and to sell oil and gas companies deals where they can get money so they make their money. So they have, a, they have an agenda, okay? And I think everybody should know that. And a lot of people read this stuff that comes out daily, you know, I don't care who they are, UBS, Raymond James, whatever, and they assume that this is true. Well, it's not false, but it's, it's truth with a, with a bias. Now, the same companies that all of these smart people tell us can break even on $4 gas tell the, the Securities and Exchange Commission every year consistently that their average marginal cost of gas production is around $7 per MCF. Now, if you tell Raymond James that it's $4, nothing happens. If you tell the government it's $4 and it's $7, you go to jail, at least theoretically. So which do I believe? 
I believe what they tell the government. Not, not that I believe it 100%, but I think it's closer to the truth. And I've been following these you know, terribly boring things, these 10K and 10Q forms. But I've been following these things for six or seven years, and the answer is always the same. And that assumes that you believe the reserve additions that they've added, and a lot of those are proved undeveloped. But let's, let's give them credit where it's due. They tell the government it's seven bucks. Now, I can tell this to a geological society, but 99% of the people who have opinions about, about shale plays and oil and gas in general are very smart people who don't have degrees in science and have never worked a day in the oil and gas business, but they know the answer. Or at least we treat them as if they do. So these are, these are just things to keep in mind. Now, I assume some people in this room are serious investors. What does a serious investor look for? Are you looking to invest in something that only makes sense on a point forward basis? Are you looking at something that just breaks even? No, of course not. You're looking for something that has long term value, that on a, on a discounted cash flow, net present value basis, I mean, you're not going to put your money in anything that doesn't make at least 10%. On the, on the, in, in the timeline of an oil and gas investment, and most people would say 20%. <clears throat> so somebody says that I can, I can break even on a shale play, well, whoop de do I mean, you're not going to get my money for a break-even deal, and that's not discounted. Well, we hear more crap about the oil and gas business than I can even tell you about. So, you know, <clears throat> If there's any Pioneer Natural Resources people in the crowd, you know, I think you're a great company. I'm, I'm sure your general counsel was just absolutely doing something, making a brick in the background. As CEO Scott Sheffield announced a few weeks ago, the Sprayberry Wolf Camp could possibly become the largest oil and gas discovery in the world. I don't even think I have to comment on that. This is a play. It was named the Sprayberry because in 1946 somebody drilled on Bob or Joe Sprayberry's ranch and discovered oil. So here's a play that's you know getting pretty close to 70 years old. And later on in his talk, he qualified it and said, well, it's probably second to Gawar. <laughs> OK, this is the kind of stuff we deal with. Uh, and I, I don't know Scott. I'm sure he's a smart guy. Um, that's what he said. U.S. is on a fast track to energy independence. Move over OPEC, here we come. Americans gaining energy independence with U.S. as top producer. And if you believe all that, somebody in this room has some swampland in Louisiana to sell you. Well, this is the reality. The reality, this is a graph of oil and gas, U.S. production and consumption since 1990. I've got another graph I can show you that goes back to 1920. The red is consumption and the green is production. So U.S. is going to become energy independent, hasn't quite reached the level we were producing in 1990, and we've got a gap between production and consumption of pretty close to 8 million barrels a day. That's more than we produce. Now, Anyone in this room who wants to explain to me how we're going to be energy independent with a graph like this that comes from the EIA, I'm really interested to hear. By the way, the gap between consumption and production has grown by 2.3 million barrels a day since 1990. So we may be gaining ground compared to three or four years ago, but we're still not anywhere close to where we need to be to be energy independent. Now, I'm not pessimistic. I can't think of anything better than for the U.S. to be energy independent. But you, you know what that means. That means we're going to have to produce 14,911,000 barrels a day as of the last time I updated this graph. And we've never been more than 10 million. That was the peak in 1970. So that's it. Well, let's look at some companies that may know something from experience. Um, some of you I know read that Shell is out of the Eagle Ford shale play, or they're hoping to be. They've already written down $2 billion in that investment. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Shell and Exxon said, gosh, you know, we're not making any money in these shale plays. We don't understand it because they're supposed to be the greatest thing in the world. But somehow we're not making any money. And then this really interesting quote from Tim Dodson. 
who is the executive VP for exploration of Statoil. As a company, we question a little bit all the hype around shale oil. How big can it be? Of course it's significant, but it's really only the Bakken. And you don't hear anything else than the Bakken from an oil perspective. Well, I'm not sure we'd all agree with Tim on that. But I will tell you that the Bakken's the only one of these liquids plays that actually makes a little bit of money on a full cycle basis. So he's, he's right on. But I mean, Statoil's in that play. They know about it. They're in the Eagle Ford. They're, they're in the, the Marcellus. They're, you know, they, I think they got in, into the Barnett, unfortunately, with, uh, with uh, Chesapeake. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the range of, uh, of experience. But here, here's, here's where we get to the, you know, the interesting stuff. My view, based on a lot of data and a lot of research, shale play models don't meet the standards of real companies. That's why Shell is out of the Eagle Ford. That's why even through its surrogate XTO, Exxon's scratching its head, maybe. I mean, that's not what they'll say, but that's what their balance sheets show. And the reason is, is that there's no profit. Breaking even on a point forward economic basis with no discount is not a profit. You're talking about partial costs. These are the basis for how we rationalize shale plays. Real companies like Shell, like Exxon, have to show real profits on a full cycle basis. It's, it's tough, you know, but that's, that's what they're expected to do. So why is everybody in these plays if, if, if we have to ask questions like I'm asking? And the answer is, because that's what we got left, folks. And, and I, you know, I take all kinds of, uh, of abuse for the fact that I'm a, on the board of directors of the Society for the Study of Peak Oil. But you know what? I mean, it doesn't take a lot of science to figure that you've got a limited resource that you're running through like gangbusters. And we've got all these companies now pounced on the United States. And they want to produce this stuff just as fast as we know how, export LNG and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we're going to run out of the stuff. We're, we're certainly, we have run out of the cheap stuff on the oil side. There's no doubt about that. So they're here because this is the best they can do. The international arena is pretty much closed to big oil companies. The national oil companies control the remaining opportunities that may look good to them. They've recycled a million other opportunities, they're all back here. Remember, they all got out of here in the 1980s because they couldn't make any money. Well, they're back. Well, here's our horseman again. Um, how did we get into this situation? I, I think that when the shale plays began, we were thinking in a conventional paradigm still, and nobody thought about the impact of having to operate thousands of crappy little wells. It costs a lot of money. Operating expense is huge. And if you don't believe me, read some of these boring 10K statements. It's not unusual to spend a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, dollar fifty per MCF in operating costs. A lot of guys driving around in pickup trucks, metering and maintaining thousands and thousands of wells. A company like Devon Energy's got almost 4,000 wells in the Barnett Shale. I mean, good for them, but it costs a lot. Overhead. Um, you know, my, 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 one of my buddies over at Chesapeake, who recently was retired, um, Steve Dixon, he told me and a group of AEPG people at a session that for every shale play Chesapeake's in, they need 5,000 people. So you got thousands of wells and thousands of people, and it all costs money. Most independents funded their capital expenditures with debt. So on top of lease operating costs and G&A overhead, now they got debt service. How much debt? Again, sometimes a buck, a buck fifty per MCF. A lot of debt. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Shell unfortunately chose their Eagleford position poorly, uh, or apparently poorly. Gets back to that fourth horseman, failure and ability to be able to identify the sweet spots for spending a ton of money. And the other thing that you got to keep in mind is that throughout this whole shale play business, we've had zero interest rates. What happens when there's no interest? People make lousy investments. Um, I would watch for things to unravel as this changes. Another question people ask all the time, well, why do they keep drilling and producing if they're not making any money? 
they must be making money, right? Well, chairman of Exxon says they're losing their shirt. Um, I don't know, I kind of believe him. Um, the deal is, is that if you're, if you're an independent oil company and you're in big time debt, your capital expenditure exceeds your cash flow, you don't have any shareholder value, all you've got is production growth and reserve growth. And if that ever goes south, then your share price goes down the toilet. And if your share price drops, then that triggers all your loan covenants and you're doing Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. You're in this cycle where overnight you're, you're history. So that can't happen. They've got to produce to keep up with investor expectations, all their ex parte owners. So we look at rig counts. Uh, that's the diagram on the left, and you can read the bad news up at the top. Every one of these plays, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, the rig counts are way down. I guarantee you that's not a good sign. If they're telling you they're making money and they're drilling less and less, then they're not making money or they've got some, some motive that I don't know about. The, the diagram on the right is really, really interesting. Uh, my friend Peter Terzakian up in Calgary just put this together. The gray tower on the left is conventional gas production in the U.S. and all the little pimples down below are shale gas production. So what's happened is, is that we're, we're still, I mean, most of our gas is still coming from conventional sources. We, we don't think that because all we talk about is shale, but the truth is, is that most of it, like half, comes from conventional and it's going down. Nobody's drilling these wells anymore. Okay. So, we're making a ton of money. There's nobody bigger than Chesapeake. Chesapeake wags the dog when it comes to shale plays. Their 2012 10K, they lost a billion dollars in net income. Their cash flow from operations was only 23% of their gross revenue. The rest was from selling assets. They had $3.3 billion in ceiling test impairments. That means that their capital expenditures did not meet their future cash flow projections, and so the SEC makes them write down those assets. They wrote down almost five TCF of gas reserves. 45% of their net present value is improved undeveloped reserves, which is vapor. And their debt was four and a half times their cash from operations. This is not a pretty picture. For the four year, by the way, this is, uh, this is the classic train wreck. Um, the picture on the right, this is what happens when a, when a steam engine rolls into the Montparnasse station, which is elevated above the street level, and somebody forgets to put on the brakes. Um, and I think that may be appropriate for Chesapeake. Uh, they sure had a good position and they didn't put on the brakes. So for the last four years, they've got 17.7 billion in ceiling test impairments, net income of minus $3.1 billion, cash flow from operations, negative 30 billion. And you say, well, they're, they're a poorly managed company. So let's look at the rest of the big players, Southwestern, Devon, EOG, and if you put them all together, all of those companies had 53 billion more in expenses than in earnings, 43 billion in ceiling test impairment write downs, an amount that represents 53% of their cash earned from operations. Now I showed that slide to a CEO of some company. He said, well, you're just showing the worst examples. And I said, yeah, and those are the four biggest shale gas producers. So if those are the worst, imagine what the rest look like. Well, this graph, you, you can't really see it's a table. This is from Bernstein Research. And what I've done here is I've shown all the, all the companies in their coverage. And the yellow is everybody that spends more than they make. So simple answer is, Almost everybody spends more than they make. Look at the top of the list, and we've got uh, Goodrich Petroleum, one of my favorites. Um, CapEx to cash flow, 770%. Uh, the average of this list is 174%. So companies are spending almost twice on average what they're making, and yet they're making a ton of money, right? Right. If this was some sort of standard investment where once they develop the fields, they can sit back and let the cash roll in. That might be an argument. 
But with a shale play, because of decline rates, you never get to stop spending. You're always spending. So here's a really good question from Goodrich's website. Why invest in Goodrich Petroleum? And maybe somebody can answer that for me. Um, here's a company that tells us that their, their realized gas price net of hedges, so this is after their hedges, is $7.23. Pretty good. So we take the first three horsemen, LOE, G&A, and interest expense, and that's $3.99. We take production tax, transportation, and process, and this is all from their website. I didn't make this up. I mean, this is copied verbatim from their website. And so other is $1.21. So they're spending $5.21, 20 cents, and they haven't drilled a well yet. They've only got a margin of 203, and they haven't drilled a damn well. This is what we're talking about, people. I mean, you, you can say maybe Goodrich is, is extreme. I don't know. Their stock keeps going up, right? All right. So let's uh, we're going to we're going to focus in now on two plays that I love to talk about: uh, the Haynesville Shale, which straddles the Louisiana Texas border, and the Eagle Ford Shale, which is our homegrown wonder. The Haynesville gas play is not commercial at current gas prices. The Eagle Ford Shale is commercial on a point forward basis. Whoop de doo. Neither play has a life cycle of high activity and production that lasts more than 10 years based on reasonable price forecasts. EUR per well in shale plays is a really dicey thing to understand, but one thing we can generalize and say, the commercial core areas are typically small relative to the overall size of the play. We're getting more and more production history. At this point, I think that the uncertainty about reserves has gone way down. So let's look at our friend, the Haynesville Shale. The map on the left shows, in yellow, the commercial portions of the Haynesville Shale at $4 point forward. If you're straining your eyes to find the yellow, it's because there isn't any. It's all blue. So the map on the right shows yellow, which are the commercial areas, at $6 gas. Okay, so we're not anywhere close to that. We're at $3.50. So at $6 gas, we actually get some commercial areas in the Haynesville. We did this by a complicated process that I'll stand by and show anyone who has the patience or the uh, doesn't mind being bored, but it's ba these are basically 12-month cumulative production maps, so there's no interpretation. Uh, which you have to believe is the correlation between the 12-month QM and the EUR. And these are our assumptions. They're pretty standard. We're assuming 10 million a well, 750,000 tie-in, you know, all the rest you can read, LOEs, 90 cents, etc. The rest are just tax, and this is an 8% return. So we're going to look carefully at, at the $6 map, and what we find is that 6% of the Haynesville active area is commercial at $6. And by the way, that's an EUR of 4.7 BCF. And no area is commercial at $4. So what does all that mean? Well, that means that wells within the core area have produced 3 TCF. There's another 1.2 based on wells that have already been drilled. And at $6, the remaining reserves range from 8 TCF to 14 TCF, depending on gas price. And what that all says is it just depends on how fast you want to drill it, but this thing isn't going to last forever. It's, it's a very limited base, even at six or more dollars per MCF. So how sure are we about the, the reserves? Well, getting pretty darn sure. So we're looking at a, a, a log of rate versus time plot, a standard ARPS plot on the upper left. On the, the lower left is rate versus Q, ar arithmetic, arithmetic. And on the right is, is a Fetkovich plot, which is just a log log plot of rate versus time. And what you see is, man, I mean, if you can fit any three of those differently, you know, have at it. Um, but those are, those are what we come up with for this particular, this is Chesapeake's uh, 2009 wells in the Haynesville and their EUR is uh, average for this group is something less than 4 TCF, 4 BCF per well, and at you know at four dollars you need like eight BCF, and at six dollars you need five. So 
uh, not commercial. So where, where did we go wrong? Well, we went wrong in the Haynesville with this hyperbolic uh, decline model. Uh, most of the reserves were figured on uh, B exponents of one or greater. We find that most wells are in the 0.5 to 0.6 range. Um, the average for the leading producers, Chesapeake, Exco, and Canna, and uh, now BHP, Billet, and Petrohawk, KCS, is 4.2 BCF, 4.7 is the break even at 6 bucks. But most producers are claiming 6 to 10 uh, based on these super harmonic decline profiles that we just don't see. And the engineering consultancy companies that audit these and the SEC continue to validate these reserves. So I'm not saying they're not doing their job, we just don't see where they're coming from. If you look at the companies and their average, what you find is that at six dollars there's two companies that are actually making money on a point forward basis, BHP and, and Shell in this play, <coughs> barely. Um, at four dollars there's about 20 wells that are actually commercial out of over 2,000. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, so that means that 73% of all the wells in the Haynesville are non-commercial at $6. It's more than 4 million acres of the play that are non-commercial at 6 bucks. Figure $55,000 an acre. Total capital destroyed in this play at $6 is $45 billion. But it doesn't count because it's a sunk cost. Talking about the Haynesville, Haynesville's a great example of this myth of efficiency that we hear so much about. Gosh, we're drilling you know, so many fewer wells and we just keep on producing gas, more and more gas. Well, that's, that's what this graph shows if you only look at the left-hand side of it. So, so this, this, this myth of increased efficiency, and we are gaining some efficiency, don't get me wrong, but it's nothing to write home about. It's a premature observation based on early data. What you see is rig count in black, gas production in red, number of producing wells in blue. So what you see is that there is a lag between drilling a well and producing a well. What a shock. I think I used to say duh on this bullet point. Um, if there's anybody from BP in the audience, uh, your chief economist has uh, has just recently focused attention on this wonder that I just showed you wasn't true. So, uh, Christoph Rule, uh, pay attention. The important thing to look at is not the rig count, it's the number of producing wells. And if the number of producing wells continues to go up, then theoretically your production ought to continue to go up. That means you drilled more wells than you could complete in a reasonable amount of time. Now, in this particular play, the number of producing wells keeps increasing and production has fallen by 2 BCF a day. That means the wells you're bringing on today are not very good compared to the ones you had before. Well, I can't get out of here without talking about the Marcellus because the mighty Marcellus is what's going to save everybody, and it may. It's a really good play. Um, however, the state of Pennsylvania doesn't report monthly production. I don't know how they get away with this, but they don't, they don't do it. And so what we've had to do is map relative performance, performance relative to a type curve. So these guys in Pennsylvania, they release six month tranches of data. What this map shows is that all the red and, and the yellow are outperforming a type curve of, I think it's 4.2 BCF. But for them to get away with this, uh, only the state and the corporations know how things are going. Uh, seems like that, that was kind of Mussolini's definition of fascism, if I remember from my undergraduate studies. The northeastern sweet spot up there in Susquehanna, Bradford, Wyoming counties, man, that, that's a killer place. I mean, I think that there's a lot of wells up there that are probably going to make 6 or 8 BCF. Uh, bad news is it's all methane. There's no NGLs whatsoever. The southwestern sweet spot, this is Washington and Greene County, not as good, but, but, but pretty good, and that's what they call the, the super wet part of the Marcellus. Now, super wet means 1,100 BTUs, so for those of you who know anything about that, that doesn't, yeah, well, whatever, it's a word, super wet. <laughs> the point of this map is even the Marcellus looks like any other shale play. 
limited sweet spots. I mean, we're talking about millions of acres in blue that are never going to make, well, I shouldn't say never, have not yet shown any indications of commercial production. And the, the Marcellus is beautifully naturally fractured. That, that's what makes it so great. And these guys are producing their asses off up here. I mean, the Marcellus is making 8 BCF a day, and there's no end in sight, and they've driven down the price of natural gas in these really high price markets in the Northeast to the point that they're now going to try and market their gas to the third world, which is us, and Canada and other third world areas. Well, this is an international talk as well as a North American, so let's talk about the push for natural gas export. Um, I guess in, in, the, in the vein of honesty, this is like the silliest idea I've ever heard of. Well, probably not the silliest idea, but the silliest idea in the context of all of this stuff. Um, the idea is really simple. We're getting, we're getting 350 for natural gas in the United States. They're paying 12 bucks in the UK and 17 dollars in Korea. So let's see, 350 into 17. Somebody got a calculator. It, it's a big number, right? So we could make all that money if we could just get it over there. Well, why is it 17 and 12 elsewhere? Well, it's called oil index pricing. Okay. Uh, LNG costs a ton of money to develop. I mean, not, not the wells, but the, but the actual liquefaction process is billions of dollars. It takes forever. And so companies invented this oil indexing to protect themselves from price swings. So basically, you're paying all that money because you're, you're indexed to the price of oil, which is high and has been high for a while. So the question is, first of all, do you think that's going to last? And second of all, do you think you can build all these export terminals for free? And the answer is, of course, you can. So the economics of export are marginal, um, except by converting existing import terminals to export. And that's not my opinion. That's an uh, article I've referenced published in the Oil and Gas Journal, which is worth reading. Um, there's considerable time, cost to design, permit, and build these facilities. And you know, the world doesn't stand still. Uh, it may just be that by the time these things are all running and we're exporting gas, the people in Europe, in Asia and Europe say, you know, we're tired of oil index prices. We're going to give you 10 bucks. And at 10 bucks, these, these deals don't fly. And by the way, there's no competition. No, everybody's going to sit around while the United States decides to send natural gas to the rest of the world. There, no, nobody's going to do anything. Well, my opinion is we need to get over ourselves about being a natural gas superpower. I mean, I'm as happy and proud as the next person that we got a whole bunch more natural gas than we thought we did. But this is an EIA graph that shows that compared to Qatar, Iran, and Russia, we're nothing, really. We got 273 TCF approved reserves, including shale gas. If you take the potential gas agency's probable, technically recoverable resources, can't do that in Spanish or any other Romance language, but you can sure string nouns together in English. Um, let's say we double our reserves. 273 plus 537 divided by 2 is 542. We're still not even close to Qatar, much less Iran or Russia. If you just throw the whole damn thing in there, 537 plus 273 proved, we're still not even equal to Qatar. So, you know, we need to get real. Um, has anybody wondered, by the way, you know, Qatar has one field that has 990 trillion cubic feet of proof reserves in it. It's right there. More than the whole United States has by any of these definitions of resources. And has anybody ever wondered why Qatar only exports 14 BCF a day to Europe? I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer to this, but that's a really good question to ask, because they could export as much as they could provide all of Europe's 330 BCF a day, and they don't. And I'll bet you the reason is they don't think they can make enough money at it, because they know what it costs them to build those trains. So why do I think that shale gas plays will not spread quickly outside of North America? Well, this is a case history I worked on. This is the Carboniferous Boland Shale in the central UK. 
Um, we don't need to get into the details, but this made a big splash in the papers uh, earlier in the summer. Somebody you know, they came out and said, ah, there's 2,000 TCF of gas in the Bolden Shale in the central UK. Well, that was gas in place. Okay? People don't understand that that's not supply today. Uh, you actually do the numbers on it, which are over in the right-hand column, and you know it's still an okay number. I mean, you might be, you, know, you might get 40 TCF or so. It's like a Barnett shale. Uh, but the point is, is that when, when we overstate resource estimates, we get the public all excited, and not necessarily in a positive way. They don't know the difference between resources and reserves, and neither do politicians. Uh, not all shales are equal. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I understand that Silurian shale play in Poland didn't work out so well. Um, it looked really good on paper, but it just wouldn't produce. So, uh, you know, uh, not everything works out the way you think. Costs outside North America are much, much higher than they are here. Uh, not so many rigs, uh, not so many service companies or infrastructure. Um, and, and, and at the end, most U.S. jail plays aren't commercial, so if you have to tolerate much higher costs, well, you know, that's a reason why they're not going to spread so fast. The big problem, though, is most countries outside of North America have no private mineral ownership, and so it's going to be really hard to get people excited about doing other, anything other than trashing their beautiful landscape. They don't get anything for it. They get damages, like maybe, I don't know, maybe they don't even get those. But you're dealing with governments, which means that they're going to award this land based on a concession, which means that if you happen to be the winner, you get to de-risk the entire basin all by yourself. What a joy. And then there's the business of population density and the geographic footprint. Now, I estimate that the Bolin Shale would require about 30,000 wells to develop. And just to give you an idea, the most populous county out there is Greater Manchester. They've got about twice the population density as Harris County. Now you can go up to Cumbria, which is uh, one of the least densely populated areas in, in this play. And everybody's going to scream because it's so damn pretty up there. They don't want to see a bunch of drilling go on. Hydraulic fracturing, you know, I mean, we, we'd like to make this go away, but it isn't going away. I don't know how many of you read the Pew uh, survey of Americans. 49% you know, of Americans think it's a terrible thing. And if Americans think it's a terrible thing, Europeans are just going to hate the hell out of it. They, you know, they, they're not big on this stuff. Let's talk about the Eagle Ford. Get away from gas for a minute. This is, uh, we've done a, a data-driven model of the Eagle Ford that suggests something between four and a half to seven and a half years of substantial drilling activity. Of course, that's based partly on spacing, and I'll talk to you about it. The point, the takeaway is, this thing is not going to last much more than a couple of years, maybe 10 years, depending on how quickly you develop it. And that's based on, I'll show you the data. So if, if you're reading all these, these rosy reports about how the United States is going to be you know, we're only going to be importing 14% of our oil by 2030. By 2030, the Eagleford's going to be a stripper play, okay? I mean, unless, unless the drilling stops or slows down a whole lot. I'll show you why. There's all kinds of black swan events that could change this. A negative change in the oil price would slow the activity. An increase in the oil price might say, well, we're going to go drill the Pearsall or the Buddha or the Edwards or something make money on that, which would mean it lasts longer than 10 years. So what do we do? Our key assumptions, uh, we're assuming a certain price environment. We took an aerial extent, and here I'm showing the good part of the play. This is Carnes and DeWitt, Gonzales, and a little bit of Live Oak County. This is where the play really works. What we did is we just said, okay, we're going to correlate the EUR to, to some uh, cumulative production. Six months, I think, is what we used. Uh, determined to cut off, uh, figured out what uh, the probable interference between wells, based a lot of this on uh, current spacing and si microseismic, and uh, the current number of wells that were so we measured an area based on a map, and we said how many wells are currently producing in that area, divide acres by wells, you come up with a spacing, and you say, okay, so what's a reasonable scenario for how many future locations are there? It's really pretty simple. 
Uh, there are a lot of wild cards in here that I won't go into, but and you can't read that, but that's okay. I just wanted to show you we did the work. The, the overall well and the overall Eagleford play, according to us, is 251,000 barrels of oil equivalent. We did that by converting the, the natural gas liquids according to a, a formula that I think could pass most people's tests. So that's positive on a point forward basis, negative on a full cycle basis. Only DeWitt County is commercial on a full cycle basis. These are our assumptions, $100, $95 oil at the wellhead, et cetera, et cetera, $7.5 million uh, drilling completion costs. So that's, that's what we did. Again, um, I, I know that there's a million people that will you know, tell me that every well out there is going to make a million barrels, and, and you know everybody's got their own opinion, but uh, this is the same kind of stuff I showed you before, and, and if, if there's there's another way of fitting that stuff. I'd love to see it. Um, there's undoubtedly, you know, a 10 or 15 percent slop in here, but I, I don't, I don't think we're way off on, on our reserve forecast. This happens to be uh, wells in DeWitt County that uh, began production in, in 2010. I can show you lots more, but um, we're getting more and more confident about about these reserves, and that's why I show you the slide. So this is the map that we ultimately use. This is the uh, six month oil, BOE, uh, cumulative production. Um, we based it on individual well decline curve analysis by county, uh, correlated EUR to six month Q, <coughs> and determined uh, cutoffs uh, that accounted for NGL yield. And so the well spacing is always tough, and I'll show you some examples of people that get carried away with well spacing. Uh, we don't have most of this data that's proprietary. Um, industry discusses spacing as tight as 40 acres per well in the Eagle Ford. That means about 330 feet between laterals. We think that's way too close, that you're just going to get reserve, uh, you get uh, uh, acceleration without adding more reserves. Uh, we think that the final optimum well spacing is in the range of about 80 to 120 acres per well. We think industry is going to be more aggressive than that, so we use a 60-acre and a 90-acre scenario. And, and we're looking at the, the microseismic up there. Basically, the microseismic shows that, that uh, a well-executed frack in the Eagle Ford goes out something you know, like 1,200, 1,100 feet. So if that's the case, um, then you'd probably like to have your laterals be not less than that amount. Uh, people don't necessarily pay attention to that, but we think that you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're drilling much closer than that on your bottom hole locations, you get too much interference. So we say uh, 750 foot spacing, that's 90 acres of well, is probably the best. Well, this is a, a zoomed-in picture of a part of Dimmitt County, which is kind of in the southwestern part of this trend. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of companies that aren't paying very much attention to um, what we think, and that, that's fine. People rarely do. Um, if, if we look in close, though, <clears throat> what we're seeing, remember, the, the break-even six-month Q is 38,000 barrels of oil equivalent. And I'm showing you the six, six, the six month cube for all these wells. And so what you see here is that whoever these yo-yos are on the left, that in, in each one of these tick marks, I think is 200 feet. So these guys are drilling like 650 feet apart. All three of their wells are commercial based on our cutoff. They're, they exceed 38,000. Uh, the guys in the middle are drilling about uh, 50 to 250 feet apart. None of those wells are commercial. The guys in the upper right, um, they're drilling about 200 feet apart, and interestingly, the only wells that start to make sense are the wells on the end, which are not being interfered with on the same basis. So uh, this is the kind of analysis that we've done. So scenario one, we're taking the current rig count of about 180 rigs. Final spacing, 90 acres. That leaves about 10,700 wells left to be drilled. That gives you four and a half years of steady activity before ramp down. Scenario two says the rig count declines down to about 150 over four years. 
steady thereafter. 60 acre spacing gives you 15,100 wells yet to drill. 7.3 years of slowly declining activity before ramp down. So both of these assume that we're going to do this right and, and, and we may not. So the commercial area in the Eagle Ford represents about 17% of the total drill play area and 29% of the wells are drilled in that core area. So that says that something like 71% of all the wells are non-commercial and 83% uh, of all the land that people spent one to five thousand dollars on is also um, toast. So I didn't do the calculation there, but it's similar to the Haynesville. Billions of dollars in capital destroyed. So the most likely case is five and a half years. And that doesn't mean the Eagle Ford plays over in five and a half years. That just means that that's peak production. You fully develop the play. And these wells are going to last. You know, some of them 15 years or so. But but the key is is that by the mid 2020s, you know, when we're going to be energy independent, the Eagle Ford, according to our analysis, is going to be a stripper play. We all know what the decline rates are, and these wells are you know wells that 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 brought came online in 2014, 10 and 11 years later, and you make it five barrels a day or something like that. So. If we look at Eagle Ford, here's a, I'm just showing the, what the, the, the base production declines at annually. It's about 35%, which isn't too bad for, for a shale play, but by comparison, on the right, I'm showing uh, the average uh, oil production in Texas. Uh, conventional oil wells in Texas decline at 2 to 3%. So we're talking about you know, 10 to 15% greater decline rates, and that's the problem. The problem is, is that you got to keep drilling these wells all the time. You can't ever stop or your production goes down the crapper. Um, the annual decline in that production base is more than 260,000 barrels of oil per day. That requires 2,000 wells just to stay flat. That's a lot of wells. We're, we're drilling them. I mean, we're, you know, we're not in danger of falling behind yet, but that's a ton of wells to have to drill just to stay flat, and people don't think of that. And of course, as your production grows, which is such a wonderful thing, then you've got to drill even more wells to stay flat. So all that means is that there's a limit to maximum production as long as you've got these super high decline rates. And, and not the whole thing is productive. Now, another one of these silly stories we hear is, is associated gas. Why is gas production remaining so, ah, well, it's associated gas from, you know, you name it, the the Eagle Ford, the Permian Basin, the Granite Wash, the Niobrara, the Mississippi Lime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, unfortunately, what this graph shows, uh, the blue at the top is uh, total associated gas by my calculation. The green line right below it is the Eagle Ford Shale. And so what this graph shows is that almost all of the so-called associated gas is from one play. It's from the Eagle Ford Shale. And all the rest of them, the, uh, the purple one in there, I think, is the, uh, is the granite wash and, and the Permian down at the bottom. I mean, you know, it's contributing gas, but it hasn't increased since, you know, since time immemorial. So, you know, basically most of these other liquids plays are not contributing very much. So it's the Eagle Ford definitely contributing almost uh, you know, three and a half BCF a day. And the Marcellus, the Marcellus is huge. So the technical conclusions of all this work, got four to seven years of significant activity in the Eagle Ford. Haynesville's not commercial at current prices. Could support more wells at $6. Final well spacing is an important thing. Uh, we think that uh, probably 120 acre spacing in the Eagle Ford and the Haynesville is about right. Uh, people are going to do denser than that. Optimum spacing may be higher in the Bakken and the Marcellus because there's better natural fracturing and somewhat better reservoirs. More general conclusions. Uh, large production volumes don't prove commercial success. We hear this all the time. You know, I don't care. I don't care how many BCF of gas we're making now versus what we were making 10 years ago. I don't know who's making any money. Shale plays involve extraordinary operating and overhead costs plus interest expense. These are not low-cost plays. Whatever anybody else wants to say, they're high-cost plays. That may be fine, 
because we need the oil and we need the gas. But anyone who tells you these are low cost plays isn't telling you everything. The plays today are marginally profitable at best. Shale gas is a commercial failure for one primary reason, the behavior of the operators. These guys have been producing recklessly like drunken sailors and if they're complaining about the fact they can't make any money, it's their own fault. You don't overproduce your, your product unless you want to lose money. And the madness continues in the Marcellus. You know, these guys no sooner screw themselves out of profit in the Barnett and the Haynesville and Fayetteville and the Woodford, and they go to the Marcellus and they're producing the living daylights out of that. The land grab approach basically prevents benefiting from what's been learned. Okay, you spent so much money on your land, you're locked in, you got to drill it, right? And it's not like, okay, now we've learned so much, the next play or the next part of the play that opens, we can be smarter about. No. I mean, I guess somebody can go in and buy Shell's land that they put up for sale in the Eagle Ford, which is in a bad place, but there's just not a lot of opportunity. Are there additional plays coming along that are going to be big? I don't think so, and I don't know of very many people that also think so in the U.S. Large new reserve additions from U.S. shale plays are unlikely. They're possible, we're always surprised, but like with most plays, you know, we kind of find the big ones first. I've shown you why I think shale plays will be slow to spread outside of North America. I um, hate to, set, to tell everyone the United States is not going to become energy independent for one simple reason. The plays don't last that long. The oil plays don't. And finally, the hope and the hype around shale plays I think creates a dangerous illusion that our energy future is secure and that nobody has to do a damn thing about changing our consumption behavior. Thank you. Um, Just hang on. You've got to use this state. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Try to use the real one, I guess. Uh, Art will take questions from the floor if there are some. So the question was, if we refrack existing wells, uh, can that somehow change the picture that I've painted? And, and, and let me be clear, I, I'm not trying to paint a negative picture, I'm trying to paint an objective picture. Um, and I'm not disputing that the resources are there, I'm not disputing that the reserves are large. What I'm saying is, you got to have a higher price to make it worthwhile. So his question was, if you refrack, doesn't that help? Well. It's a cost-benefit analysis, as with anything else. So you're going to refrack. Um, what's that going to cost you? Well, you know, in the Eagle Ford, the first frack is going to cost you about six million bucks. So it's not a trivial amount of money. It's not like a workover, okay? Uh, so you, you got to do the economics and say, well, okay, if we refrack the well, does the additional reserves that we are able to drain pay off the investment? And I, I can't answer that question, but my, my guess is that uh, unless, you can, unless you can do that re-stimulation for substantially less than the first time around, it isn't going to pay. Now, our buddies at Pioneer have a great video that I encourage everybody to look at as to how come the spray berry is going to be second only to go on. And what they say, or what he says, their COO, is that, well, the spray barrier is so thick that we can go drill one lateral here and another one here and another one here. It's just like, you know, layers of the cake. And, and, and the question that I want to ask is how much does each one of those cost? I'm, I'm not disputing that you can do it, but do you get enough reserve from each of those expensive laterals to justify the cost? So. Uh, certainly wouldn't take issue with your petroleum engineer friend who says that it's commercial. Um, I would be skeptical, as I am with all things, um, that uh, unless you can show me that you're going to frack into reserves that aren't currently being drained by your original well, um, I'd hate to put my, well, I wouldn't want to rush to put my money into it. 
Other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> His question was, uh, you know, what about all the jobs this creates? You know, I think it's fantastic. There's no question that all of this activity creates a lot of jobs, and, and, and we need jobs, okay? Um, the question is, the real question is, um, how long do those jobs last? What happens when activity begins to decrease? I mean, we've all studied booms of various kinds before. We've looked at gold rushes, okay? Every, I mean, you know, it's not real different. Everybody that goes to a gold rush thinks he's going to get rich. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people you know, travel continents to go get rich. And usually what happens is they end up being just as poor there as they were wherever they started. Uh, the people that make the money are the people that figure out how to get them out there, the people that sell them Levi's, the people that run the bars and the brothels. They're the ones that make all the money. So the point is, is that initially everybody thinks they're rich, and when they're all said and done, you know, it's just another ghost town, and, and, and that's the problem, that once once the activity ramps down, all those jobs hopefully go someplace else. So I'm all in favor of jobs, and there's no question that this shale boom is creating jobs. Are they jobs that are the jobs that are going to last? Well, you look at our Eagle Ford example; they're jobs that are going to last about five and a half years. Certainly better than no jobs. Uh, the question that you need to ask is: go down to those counties that were intending on certain tax revenues based on all of this good stuff and ask them why they're a million dollars in the hole on their 2013 budget, because they're not paying the way that they should. When this question was, if I looked at other plays like the Niobrara, like you know, the Montney or the Horn River up in Canada, and the answer is yes, I have. Uh, the Niobrara is, uh, is not too impressive so far, uh, certainly in terms of its, uh, I think I have the, the graph up there, uh, you know, it's not adding a whole lot of oil or gas to, to, the, to U.S. supply at the moment. I think, I think that the, the results in the Niobrara are very positive in the Wattenberg field. Um, you know, there's no place to find oil like an oil field. I think that the results are somewhat mixed uh, as an exploratory play. And by the way, I mean, the very first exploration project I ever worked on, I'm old, was the Niobrara in eastern Colorado in 1978. This is not a new idea, folks. I mean, the Bakken's not new. Um, these are old ideas, and, and like the spray bear, you know, you're going to squeeze some more blood from a stone, but if you think it's going to be the next Gawar, uh, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath. I really am. Uh, the Montney is, for the most part, a, a gas play with some liquids. Uh, the Montney is, is, is more similar to the Bakken in some ways, and that it's really not a shale. And there are places for it to shale, but most of the Montney is really a, a tight gas sand play. It's a, it's a sandy siltstone or silty sandstone, and so the reserves are pretty good. Uh, the problem with the Montney is, is that if you think that U.S. gas prices suck, they're even worse in Canada. Uh, the Montney also has the benefit of being quite thick in certain areas. If you look over in the the Swan area, which is in Canada's, or the Glacier area, which is advantages. Uh, you know, it's 300 meters thick, and so you do. You know, if you, if you believe the pioneer guy with all of his, you know, layers of the cake and different laterals, uh, that there is some potential there. Horn so the question is, how much of the shale plays are actually some other kind of something resembling more of a reservoir? Well, it it, it varies from from play to play. It, just about every every shale play that I've looked at has some preferred zone, you know. But however you want to define that, if if you think it's a you know more of a siltstone or a limestone or whatever, but there there's definitely there are definitely zones, and it's real important to stay within that zone uh, for reasons of you know frac natural fracturing, brittleness, fracturability, if you will, uh, thermal maturity, porosity. I mean, I think. You know, everybody ought to look at the, the the Barnett study that the Bureau of Economic Geology completed about a year ago and is dribbling out in little bits and pieces. But uh, you know, they find that that one of the biggest controlling factors of the Barnett surprise is porosity, 
and the porosity in the Barnett is related to uh, carriage and conversion to gas. And there's a volumetric change when that occurs, and so if you happen to be in one of the thermally more mature parts of the Barnett, you win because you get a couple extra percent porosity, which means more storage. So, you know, geology does matter, and I think that's where Don is going with your question. And, and so I always ask my friends who are with service companies or with some of these big uh, producers, I mean, how much science goes into, you know, choosing well locations? And I think the answer is, as with, I guess somebody told me, Whenever I ask a geologist a question, the answer is always, it depends. And, and, and that's probably true, but it does depend. And, and, and I think that from what I know, I mean, almost all of these companies have really good scientists who are working for them. The impact of that scientific work on choosing where they lease and where they drill, I think varies according to the company. I further believe that the farther into these plays that companies get, the more they tend to rely on science. Unfortunately, they've already locked in their, their land positions. So um, I can't give you a quantitative answer to your question, Linda, except that um, I believe that geology really matters. And in the end, you know, we're, what I said in the beginning is we don't know that much about these plays. I mean, we, we talk about them as if we do, and I probably sound like I know a lot about them. I don't. Uh, you know, think about it. We've been we've been drilling sandstone and limestone reservoirs for 150 years, and we've got, I mean, just volumes and volumes of study and data on, you know, rock properties and uh, you know, the, the the dimensions of these reservoirs and the distribution of porosity and permeability within them. So we drill it well, and we think we're, you know, in a, in a barrier bar or something like that. Those are preserved in the ancient record, but let's just say they are or were. Um, you know, we can immediately go and say, well, okay, so, you know, if we wanted to get better porosity, where would we go, or how, what do we think the lateral dimensions of this thing are? With the shale, I mean, we don't know. We're, we're, we're learning as we go, and what we're finding is that each one of these shales is different than the next. Uh, or at least we haven't drilled enough of them yet to say, oh, well, this is just like that. We haven't found them yet. So, um, I, I guess that's the, you know, that's the fun part and that's the exciting part for those of us who've made our careers or plan to make the rest of them in doing science. And there's a lot of science to be done and I, I don't see that, that there's a lot of companies that are standing up saying, oh, we don't need any stinking science. Um, I, I think everybody, everybody in their right mind recognizes that we all need a lot of help. Well, that, and I guess there wasn't really a question in that, but, but, I, but I agree with the comment that um, with most of these plays, if, if you, yeah, I mean, for any of us that have worked South Texas, uh, there's a pretty obvious parallel between the trend of the Eagle Ford production and the trend of, you know, just about any of the tertiary reservoirs or even some of the deeper reservoirs, the, the, the Edwards, which he mentioned underneath it, and those are all structurally influenced, if not controlled. So how does that apply to a shale play? Well, I can't say that I honestly know, but my, my, my suspicion is that it's got to do with fracturing. Um, I, you know, I look at some of these, these really great shale wells, and there are many of them, and, and ask, well, how in the world do you get, I mean, for, for this many BCF or thousands of barrels of oil, what kind of a drainage radius are we talking about here? And, and is that really consistent with you know, the kind of stimulated volume that's been produced? And the answer, I think, is if you intersect some natural fractures, you bet. So you're draining a much larger area. Now, I've worked, I've worked the Austin Chalk. I've worked uh, a number of unconventional plays. And you know, in the Austin Chalk, there's no doubt. I mean, fracturing is the key. And, uh, you know, Pearsall and Luling and Giddings, um, you know, those fields weren't drilled uh, because somebody had a cool idea about a stratigraphic trap in the Austin Chalk. I mean, those were, those all had structural reasons to be drilled. I mean, I think Luling was 1923. Nobody drilled a well in 1923 unless there was some plane table anomaly. Now, whether it turned out to be the structure that they thought or hoped is another story altogether. But, um, so, with, with few exceptions, and, and the Barnett may be one. I just don't, I don't understand the Barnett that well. I have, 
not yet found a structural component to the, to the Barnett that jumps out at me. Now, I don't have access to company data, seismic data, but you look at the Haynesville. And you know, who were the winners in the Haynesville? Well, the winners, the big winners, I think, were uh, Petrahawk, KCS, who are now BHP Billiton. Well, why were they the winners? Because they bought KCS, and KCS had all this Cotton Valley production that was all structurally controlled, and all the, the Haynesville sweet spots are right on top of, or below, or whatever. I guess they're below the, uh, the Cotton Valley, so there, there's a correlation. Marcellus, it, it's still early to say, but I, I've been told there's a, there's a structural component there. So everything helps. Fractures help, I think. Now, there are people in the, in the business, closer to it than I am, that say, no, 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 no. You know, we, we, we got to frack the country rock. If we get into natural fractures or faults, uh, that's going to drain the frack energy. And I talk to my friends in the service companies that help these people, and they say, well, no, actually, you don't have enough power to really make a big difference in the country rock. I don't know the answer, but I think his observation is a good one, and one that I agree with. Yes, sir. So his question, for those of you who couldn't hear, um, was how would I compare conventional plays, 21st century conventional plays, with shale plays and, and reconcile the fact that as, as a play, most plays are non-commercial. It's, it's that they have fields within them that make money. And if I gave the impression that, that I was simply talking about the plays, then um, I'll I'll make sure that I leave you with a different impression. We're looking at the cores. Okay, now core area is, is a new, it's a 21st century word for a field. Okay, that's, that's what it is. And, and, and so my, my answer to your question, Clint, is that an unconventional play or a shale play is not different than a conventional play except the reservoir sucks. It's, it's, it's the same, you go about analyzing it the same. You've you got this gigantic area, most of which is not commercial. You're not interested in that. What you're interested in are the sweet spots or the fields. And there are discrete fields. And I, tonight I, you know, I haven't had time to talk about the Bakken. I'd love to come back and talk about the Bakken. The Bakken is real clear. I mean, there, there are discrete fields. Uh, you, know, you look at a field like uh, Parshall. Uh, which is an EOG field that's part of that three forks pinch out uh, up to the northeast. And, and you can look at EOG's wells that were that started production in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, and they keep getting worse and worse. And you plot where they are on a map and they're drilling farther and farther out towards the field limits, just like with a regular field. So you you know if your field's a structure, you can drill your first well on top. And maybe that's the best place and maybe it's not. You're going to drill a few appraisal wells and figure out where the best areas are. But once you've defined the field, you're probably going to drill the best wells in that next generation. And as you move towards poorer areas of the field structurally or stratigraphically or down towards the margins, they get worse. We see the exact same thing in the shale plays. It's just, it's just not all that different. And, and part, of the, part of the hype is that somehow this idea of, of a manufacturing model uh, still persists, even though everybody knows it's crap. I mean, it doesn't work. Uh, they're, they're, you know, it's not the same everywhere. It's very different. It's all about you know, where is their reservoir and where is there the correct thermal maturity, and et cetera. So my answer simply stated is I agree with everything you're saying. We're not interested in the 75% of any play, shale, offshore, conventional, that doesn't pay. We're interested in the fields, and the fields are going to be somewhat better and somewhat worse depending on their size, depending on their trapping mechanism, if I can be that bold to say that there is a trapping mechanism. Uh, there, there's got to be something that defines an accumulation, and whether we have to invent new words like sweet spots to, to describe that, I'll, I'll leave to the, you know, the people that own those fields. So I don't think it's all that different, and I think that's your point, Clint. I don't think it's different at all. Anybody else? All right, well, I'll stick around a while. I'll be glad to talk to people, and uh, thank you all for your attention.